clarity comes by the teaching of your word. Nobody lives here the same way they came. We pray for people all over the world connected to this service that the light of God, God, God's word shines in the dark areas of their minds. And we rejoice that by the end of this service, we'll all be the better for it. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Say with me these words as we release our faith together. I believe the word of God. I am what it says I am. The word of God is final authority in my life. In spite of my circumstances, in spite of my situations, I believe the word of God. Today I receive instructions, direction, and clarity by the word of God. At the end of this service, I know what to do. I know where to do it. And I know clearly what the spirit of God is saying to me. And I will never be the same in Jesus' name. And every believer says a powerful amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of the social media community, brothers and sisters online. We're so glad to welcome all of you to the service this morning, guys. It's going to be an exciting study in the word of his grace. We also want to welcome all of the Aquaibom State community connected to the service right now by way of Comfort FM, XL FM, Radio Aquaibom, Passion FM, Inspiration FM, and Heritage FM. Always an honor and a joy to serve you the grace of God. And we want to ask you to kindly do me the favor of calling a friend, a loved one. Ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. I also want to ask the social media community to help me. Let's get this word to the ends of the earth. Share the videos, put them on as many groups as possible. Let's get the word around the world. Our campus is all over the world. What a joy to have all of you brothers and sisters connected to the service online this morning. We're going to have an exciting in time together can somebody shout a powerful amen are we excited to be in the house this morning can we go ahead and celebrate our fellowship with a shout that doesn't sound like a celebration shout glory amen grab your pen your notebook your bible and your phones and you can be seated with your sweet smart self this morning as we get into the word of his grace now, it's important for me, just before we get into all of this, while you're still sharing the videos with all the groups where you belong to, it's important for me to call your attention to a number of things. First of all, I'm sure you know that our vision is to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. And it is that vision that gets us to do all the things we do in this house, in our campuses around the world, and all over the world, actually. Now, it's important for you to also realize that our church is an apostolic house. Our church, our ministry, is an apostolic house. What makes a ministry an apostolic house, and that's very important, and that's very instructive for you to know, what makes a ministry an apostolic house is the ministry of the word and prayer. That's what makes a ministry an apostolic house. The ministry of the word and prayer. The apostles in the book of Acts says, we will not serve tables. That's not our mandate. We will not leave the word of God and be sharing food. We know that there are people among us who need food, who are needy, but we will not leave the main work to be serving food because that's not part of our, our job description. So let's choose a few people to take care of that. But we, the apostles, we will give ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. That is what makes an apostolic house. You can't belong to an apostolic house like this and not be given to prayer and the word. You can't. Then you, you're not a part of us. Because the definition of an apostolic house is the ministry of the word and prayer. Those are the two things that defines a true Bible apostolic house. The responsibilities of an apostolic house is evangelism and discipleship. Those are the responsibilities of an apostolic house. Discipleship and evangelism. You can't belong to an apostolic house 
and not be given to evangelism and discipleship, then you are not really a part of us. You are just floating. Because that is what defines a true Bible apostolic house. And that's what we are. So four things. Number one, the ministry of the word and prayer. And then responsibility. Evangelism and discipleship. And if you read throughout the Acts of the Apostles, that was what was very predominant. The word, prayer, and of course, if you're given to prayer, you will follow the spirit. You will operate in the realm of the spirituals. And by now, if you've been given to all the prayer we've been praying from the beginning, we're going on a 40 days. We're almost halfway the journey. If you've been given to prayer by now, you shall have started having specific instructions on how to structure yourself in the study of the word, the kind of things you need to do with yourself where prayer is concerned through the course of this year. By now, you should have started having instructions on what to do in giving yourself over to evangelism. Campus coordinators and our campuses, by now, you will have started receiving instructions on what to do in your community, in your city, to flood the place with the truth of the gospel. And also, you will have started receiving, if you've really been praying and paying attention by now, you will have started receiving instructions on what to do concerning, you know, um, raising disciples. And some of you by now, you will have started receiving instructions on how to structure your finances. How to structure your finances through the course of this year. And ensure that your finances are effectively utilized in the advancement of God's purpose. By now, you will have re started receiving light and clarity in those areas. You will have also started receiving instruction and light on what to do with your relationships. What kind of relationships to keep, which relationships to fold up and clear out of your life. By now, you will have also known what to do where your family is concerned, your wife and children, or your husband and your children. By now, you will have started receiving instructions. If you are not just praying careless prayer, like, And by now you will have started structuring some kind of action, you know, action plan for 2022. Because as the whole intent, we are not in a parade. No, this is very deliberate. What the Spirit of God is having us do as a house. And that's why it's important to realize we are not just a church. We are an apostolic house. And in every apostolic house, these are the things that are predominant. You give yourself to prayer. You give yourself to the word. You give yourself to evangelism. You give yourself to discipleship. And as you press in prayer, the leading of the spirit becomes very obvious and indicative as to the areas of your life. The spirit of God will be giving you directions, instructions. Some of you will have instructions concerning your job, concerning your businesses, concerning your career. Things you need to adjust. Things you need to change. Things you need to take note of. Things you need to be conscious of. Things you need to observe. By now you will have been having light in those areas. Because Jesus said, I am the light of life. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. There's, there's no darkness here. There's no error in this place. Can I hear you say with me very loud, there's no darkness here. Can I hear you say it very loud, there's no darkness here. Say this environment is error free. I live in an error-free environment. I have clarity. I have precision. I know what to do with every area of my life, even as we go forward. I didn't hear a powerful amen. The book of 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 15, we're still looking at Brother Paul's revelation of identification. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse number 15, and we've covered quite some grounds, and I want to encourage those of you that have been careless about our meetings. You need to pay attention. You need to pay some more attention. You know, um, look up to me, everybody. The truth of the matter is, if you do not pay close attention to what is going on here, after a while, you will be lost. You will be in this church, but you are lost. 
And once you are lost, you will be out of place. And once you're out of place, that's the end. You don't go be that. You just be there floating. You just be there floating. We are not in a religion. We are in a deliberate walk with God. You need to pay attention and pay intentional attention to the things we are teaching. <laughs> Is it the, the Hebrew? The Hebrew brethren that the writer of Hebrews was taking, talking to. He said we need to pay the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them sleep. People are slippery. And because people are slippery, that's why you need to pay attention. People are slippery. Human beings generally are slippery. That's why it takes the teaching of the word of God to get you rooted and grounded so you don't sleep off. It's not the word of God that sleeps off. It's people that sleep off. Because people are slippery. You can be among us, but you're no more connected to the lifeline. You're just floating. And after a while, you start feeling out of place. You just feel out of place. You feel lost. And how can you be in the light and be lost? Other than that, you're not paying attention. Everything we teach in this church is for your consumption. There is nothing we're teaching just for the elders. It's for your consumption. So you need to pay attention. You need to intentionally make up your mind by all means to understand everything I teach. Anyone you don't understand, you go back to your notes. Get the material, play it, sit down with it. I must understand this thing. That's how to grow. Spiritual growth is not accidental. Spiritual growth is intentional. Nobody grows accidentally. People grow intentionally. There's a level of discipline required for growth. It's important. You know, I'm, 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 I'm your spiritual father, so I can pick up things in the spirit. And I, I really need to talk to you this morning like this. You don't grow accidentally. You grow intentionally. We are not playing games. We have set up a program for you in this fasting. That program is not given to, your, to you whether you like or not. It is intentional. You must participate because that is how to grow. No student who avoids lectures in school graduates. And even if he graduates, he graduates a bad product. And he remains a bad product if he is not taken for the, for the whole of his lifetime. We have set out for you a program that is very easy if you are a very serious person. 5 to 6 a.m. we pray. You go about your day. Six in the evening, we're in church. We teach, we pray. You go home. Nine o'clock to ten o'clock, another teaching to help you on direction. Because that's what you need for the rest of your life. Then, of course, ten to eleven, we pray. And you are free to sleep if you want to sleep. My yoke is easy, my body is light. Except you're a joker. If you're a serious person in life, you should be grateful that you have somebody that is planning life for you. I'm organizing your life for you the way it ought to go. And for me, as far as I'm concerned, I think following is easier than leading. Because I don't have to do anything, I just follow. A leader has to think and take responsibility for every decision, take responsibility for every choice, take responsibility for everything that happens. Your own is just to follow. It's easy to follow. You know, this morning, if, even if I don't preach anything to you, what I'm saying to you is very serious. It's very serious. And you have to pay attention, including the online people. You have to pay attention because the online people, you're part of this house, even though you're not physically here. You know, you're part of this house. There are some of you online, you're even more serious than people that are sitting down here physically. And I know what I'm talking about. Some of you are more serious than some of the people that are physically in this building. And that is an indictment. So I'm speaking to the whole of Power City. 
all the campuses and everybody who follows this ministry, including those who are, you know, spiritual sons to this house and daughters, you need to take these things very serious. What we're doing here is the already shaping the next five years, the next 10 years, the next 30 years of your life. The outcome of your life in 30 to 50 years from now is dependent on the things we are doing now and dependent on how serious you take the things that we are doing now. Brother Walter, come. You see, Brother Walter, he's new in church. I remember when he came to this church newly, he was always asking questions. But now he's raising disciples. He's on fire. He's intentional. He's intentional. All our leaders know that he's an intentional person. But he's new in church. Brother Daniel come. He's also new in church. He's new in church. The man is on fire. They are deliberate. They are intentional. They are in, they're in every meeting. They are taking notes. They are involved in spiritual exercises. Please go back. They've not been in this ministry for long. But they have become an example. I can call a few more. They are not the only ones. It's just because they are in front and it's easy to get them out. Some of us are. <laughs> you need to sit up. We are not gaming. Mm -mm, this is not a game station. It's a serious matter. It's your life we are talking about. Your life now and your life in the life after now. Are you following me? This is very serious. All right. Second Peter 3.15. <clears throat> Brother Paul's revelation of identification... And we've been looking at the uniqueness of the Pauline, Pauline theology, the uniqueness of the Pauline epistles. He says, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, next verse, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. The, that word salvation is the word soteria. And then it says, Brother Paul has a sophia, a wisdom, an insight. We clarified a few days ago that Paul has wisdom, and when you use the word sophia, it deals with your use of words, your use of words, and your skillfulness of explanation. When you use the word Sophia, it deals with use of words and skillfulness of explanation. And that came in a lot in the way Brother Paul spoke. It showed a whole lot in the insight that he had. And we mentioned the fact that some people were now distorting the word. They were distorting the teachings of Brother Paul. And we, we, we came up with a Greek word, the word strebolu, from the word strefo. They were twisting the use of words. They were, they, were, they were taking Brother Paul's words and twisting it out of Brother Paul's usage. In other words, we must abide faithful with the things that the Pauline theology teaches. Now the question would now be, was Paul faithful to Jesus? Was Paul faithful to Jesus? From the things we have taught so far, we can answer in the affirmative. Yes, he was. He was faithful to Jesus because his use of the Old Testament and Jesus' use of the Old Testament was the same way. So he was faithful in how he explained the Old Testament. Because really, what Peter was referring to here is the Pauline insight into the Old Testament books. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, he says to Timothy, and from a child, the word brephos, and that from a child, thou hast known the word oida. Brephos, child, thou hast known, known is the word oida, the Holy Scriptures. It means you know your way around the Holy Scriptures, which 
are able to make thee wise, the same word Peter used for Paul, Paul is using for Timothy, which are able to make thee Sophia wise or give you an insight unto salvation through faith which is in, in Christ Jesus. So this guy, Timothy, from a child he has become acquainted. He knows his way around the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. So brother Paul used the same word that was used for him for Timothy, which means what Paul was saying is Timothy, you have understood my way of interpreting the Old Testament. The same way I, am, I have insight is the same way you have insight. That is, you, you, you are acquainted with my Sophia, my way of interpreting the Old Testament. So that's the way Jesus also used the scriptures. You know, we, we took time to look at the Pauline method. We saw Paul's method, Paul's message, Paul's style, and Paul's ministry. It is in full agreement with Jesus' ministry. You know, Jesus' method, Jesus' style, Jesus' message, Jesus' ministry was in tandem with the way Brother Paul also operated. We've seen that so far. That's why you will hear Jesus say in Matthew 7, 28, Matthew chapter 7, verse number 28, Jesus is saying, and it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. At his doctrine. Next verse. At his didascalia. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So that means there's a way the scribes teach. And there's a way Jesus taught. And that way Jesus taught is the way Paul taught. Paul didn't teach as the scribes. He taught like Jesus will teach. Which means Jesus differed from the Pharisees. So the problem and the challenge that brother Paul faced with the Pharisees was not unique. The same way he had problem with the Pharisees, Jesus also had problem with the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 7 where we just read, they were astonished at his didache. They were astonished at his didache, his way of explaining scripture. They were astonished at his way of explaining scripture. Remember, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 12, look at what Jesus warned. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the living of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He warned about the living of the Pharisees. We saw that in Acts chapter 15 verse 5 where they, they were insisting that they must command the Gentiles to circumcise, to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses, a sect of the Pharisees. So Jesus warned them to beware of the living of the Pharisees. When the Bible talks about the, the Pharisees, is talking about their opinion. You know, the Bible says they rose. That word, they grew over time. They grew over time. And you know, that's why Jesus used the word living. Because the living grows in influence. When there is living, it grows in influence. In other words, if it is unchecked, false doctrine will grow in influence. If it is unchecked, false doctrine will grow in influence. For example, you know, like the things we've been looking at from the word of God. How on earth will, will people have always thought that when people die, they go to heaven? Where did they get that from? Like I said the other day, so heaven becomes an advanced mortuary where dead people are gathered. And there's no such teaching in the scriptures. You see, but when false doctrine is unchecked, it grows in influence over time. So brother Paul was faithful to Jesus. Well, you know, and then some people will say, well, you know, it doesn't matter. 
doesn't matter if they are teaching wrong doctrine, you teach your own. <laughs> it matters. We have a responsibility to shine the light where there is darkness. Somebody say, I hear you. We have responsibility to shine the light where there's darkness. They see us challenging false doctrine and they call it attacks. That's mischievous. That is real. That's real being mischievous. Because how can challenging false doctrine be an attack? We are not dealing with persons here. We're dealing with issues. Issues. For example, when a man says... If you don't pay tight, you will not go to heaven. That's a damnable heresy. What did I call it? That's a destructive heresy. Because what that does is it now tells a man that doesn't have Christ, all God needs is your money. Once you can bribe God with money, you have access into heaven. That's a damnable heresy. That's not even an issue to glide over. That's not even an issue to play with. Because it borders on the things that affect men's eternity with God. Which is what Jesus gave his life for. And we can't let such things to just glide. Jesus said, beware. He also spoke in a way that Jesus himself exposed falsehood. He exposed falsehood. And Jesus is the model for ministry. Jesus told them, beware. Why should they beware? Because of the falsehood that was going around. It's not a personal fiefdom that we have to protect. Anybody who is teaching scripture must be ready for his teaching of scripture to be scrutinized. Anybody who says he's a teacher of scripture must be open for his teaching of scripture to be scrutinized. I'm brought under the greatest of scrutiny to see whether you are saying is true or not. And if it is false, we say exactly what it is. This is false. We don't mean words. If it is false, we say this is false. I call some of my teachings back in time false. And I apologize for them. I didn't mean words. I didn't try to say, well, you know, no, I was very direct. I said, these prosperity things I have taught over the years, they are wrong. If you don't give, you will not be blessed. It's a lie. Your offering will clean your suffering. It's fraudulent. I didn't, I didn't cover up the things I taught that were wrong. I exposed them. And I confess to them and I apologize to them before the whole world. The videos are there. Why? Because it is simply honest to know when you didn't teach the right thing and to know when you have taught the right thing. And that's why we must stay with scripture. We don't follow what people teach because most of the things that I taught in time past that were false were the things I was taught by the people I looked up to to teach me the Bible. And I've said it over and over. The reason why I ran with what they gave me was because I thought it was the truth. But as I grew in years and I grew in the things of the spirit and I began to look at the word of God for myself. And I began to search the scriptures by myself. I brought my own teachings under scrutiny. And I scrutinized them very well and trashed them. And expose them to the world that this is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong. I thought that if I did that to myself, who will I spare? If I did it to myself and I didn't see it as attacking myself, who will I spare? You are, you are shouting, Dr. Damina is attacking fathers. Am I a boy? I'm also a father. A grandfather for that matter. Because some of my sons are fathers. If I did not spare myself. So I will now spare another person. The only person that matters in this matter is Jesus. That's the only person. That's who died for us. That's who paid for our salvation. That's the person who ultimately will live it forever. Am I communicating at all? So anybody who crosses the path, we will expose him. We will carry the light and shine. 
Look at him, look at him, look at him. If you're a Bible teacher, you must be willing and you must be ready to allow your teachings come under very clear and critical scrutiny from the same word of God. Because the word of God is self-explanatory. All the answers to scripture are in scripture. We don't need extra material to interpret scripture. Scripture interprets itself. I'm teaching good here. What is false doctrine? False doctrine is false. It's an incorrect explanation of the scriptures. I have told you, it doesn't matter who is preaching it. Once the scriptures are not rightly divided, anything the preacher is saying is what? Please talk to me, Power City. I want the radio audience to hear you. Once a preacher is not rightly dividing the word of truth, it doesn't matter the gyration, the drama, the the shout, the voice, and the, 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 the modulation of his voice. What he is saying is what? It's a lie. And you cannot get truth from a lie. The truth of scripture only comes to bear when the scriptures are what? Rightly divided. And Paul cautioned his son Timothy. He said, if you don't want to be ashamed. Somebody said, why is Dr. Damina shaming the fathers? If the fathers do what they need to be shamed for, we will shame them. Because Paul already said, if you don't want to be ashamed, then you must rightly divide the word of truth. So a man that does not rightly divide the word of truth, what is he going to be exposed to? Shame. You know, when we are children, if you do something wrong, what do we use to shout? Shame. We we'll even do our eyes like that. Shame. Teaching good this morning. There's something on me this morning. <laughs> An incorrect explanation of scripture is what we call false. So Jesus warned against that. Peter also warned against the same things. In 2 Peter 3.16, where we first started reading, second, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures. Look at what, where the lacuna is. It will be unto their own destruction. And it's the, the, the problem there is, it's not, they are not the only ones that will be destroyed. Those that also hear them will be destroyed alone. So that's the danger there. Those that hear them will be destroyed. Strebulu from strefo to distort the proper interpretation of the scriptures. That's the meaning of twist. To distort the proper interpretation of scriptures in the light of Jesus. When scriptures are not properly interpreted in the light of Christ... It will destroy men. I said earlier on that Jesus therefore trained his disciples the way to think through the scriptures. He trained his disciples on the way to think through the scriptures. He called discipleship a pattern or a mode. And we asked earlier, did Paul differ from Jesus' pattern? And the answer is no, he did not. He advanced in the same mode and in the same truth. He advanced in the same mode and in the same truth. Of course, his being advanced as Paul was Christ in him. His being advanced as Paul was as a result of Christ in him. In fact, he said, when it pleased God to reveal his son in me, Galatians chapter 1. When it pleased God to reveal his son in me. So it is Christ in Paul that gave us the Pauline epistles. Because if you say it's Paul, you are departing from the truth. What is the truth? Matthew chapter 28 verse 20. Look at what Jesus said to them. He said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And it's not only that I commanded you and lo. I am with you always unto the end of the world. Amen. So it was Jesus that was with that is with us always 
that was with Paul and in Paul bringing out the advanced explanation of what he taught in the four gospels. Lo, I am with you always. That means he never departed. I am with you to the end of the age. And so Paul therefore taught strongly about what we com you know, commonly speak in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll look at that in a few minutes. But earlier on we said the Logos. The Logos is the sum of the message in the entire interpretation. Please write that down. That will help you a lot. The Logos is the sum of the message in the entire interpretation. The Logos is the sum of the message in the entire interpretation. And you can call it a short form of writing a long hand. You can call it a short form of writing a long hand. That is, that, that is something somebody said over three hours can be summarized in two verses. Can be summarized in two verses. And then you are now giving the same book that is summarized in two verses to explain for three hours. Somebody spoke for three hours. It is summarized in two verses. And you are given the two verses to explain for three hours. Which means the summary must be in a way that when you look at the summary, you see the things that are said and you see the things that are not said. The summary must be the, 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 the skillfulness with words in the summary must be such that when you look at the Logos, you can take the Logos, which is two verses, and bring out a detailed teaching from those two verses. Somebody said, we can all read the Bible. Yes, but then we have those who will now explain. All of us can read the Bible. But then we have those that are mandated to explain. And that's what we're doing right now in church. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1. Let's look at brother Paul. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1. Moreover brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. Next verse. By which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Next verse. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Next verse. And that he was seen of Kephas, then... Of the twelve. Notice what he says. According to the scriptures. There's no verse like that. There's no verse in the Bible. That is written according to the scriptures. So that is what we call the logos. According to the scriptures. There is the logos. That is. This is the message. That. Christ died for our sins according. So when you take the entire message of the scriptures, what it is saying in summary, the whole scriptures, is that Christ died for our sins. That's the Logos. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the summation of the message of the entire scriptures put together is that Christ died, he was buried, and the third day he rose again. Now that is the logos brother Paul was communicating to the church in Corinth. That is, by the time you interpret all the scriptures together, you do what we call the tsunami. The tsunami. Do you remember the tsunami? In Luke 24, 45, then openly their understanding that they may soon me the scriptures, that they may soon me 
of all the scriptures put together, you arrive at this is the message. This is a short form of synthesizing all the scriptures together. He died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. That's a short form, of course. He extends it in verse 14 of that same chapter. I'm talking about Paul. Verse 14. Look at that. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Then look at how he extends it in verse 17 of the same chapter. Verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. It's still an explanation of he died, he was buried for us, and on the third day he rose again. If he didn't rise, which means the resurrection is our justification. So now he's expanding the concept. The, the resurrection is the forgiveness of sins. Because if he never rose, you are still in your sins. If he never rose, your faith is in vain. So he's expanding, he's expanding the logos. But what is the logos? He died, he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures put together. That is the subject matter. That is the subject matter. Stay with me. <clears throat> now, I love brother Paul. In verse 11, look at how he now brings in his skillfulness in the use of words. Therefore, whether it were I or they, Kai, this guy, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believed. <laughs> so we preached and so you believed. Sophia, insight, wisdom, in Paul's letter is a mode of explanation. That Sophia is a mode of explanation or what we call a depth of reasoning. A depth of reasoning or a depth of explanation and reasoning. But it's not a different explanation. It is the same explanation, but there is a depth of reasoning that accompanies that same explanation with a use of more robust vocabulary, yet without deviating or losing the essence of the subject. With no deviation. Just an expansion of the same. For example, if Christ be not risen, our faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Why? He died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again according to the scriptures. So the resurrection brought the subject of justification. So look at brother Paul's didache. So when he talked about, he rose for our justification. Justification alone, alone. He wrote an entire book on the expansion of justification called the book of Romans. The whole book of Romans is an expansion of the Logos, which is justification by faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1.16. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall come alive by faith. Then he begins to expand. The Logos according to the scripture. Am I communicating at all? Please stay with me. Now, in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 to 8, Brother Paul spoke about the fact that if anyone, including himself, preach anything different, let the person be a cause, anathema. So you have that short form. There's a reasoning, you know. You know, people think that Bible interpretation, <laughs> you know, people think that Bible interpretation is writing one very long essay with plenty scriptures, and they call it corroboration. Corroborative evidence. If you will copy something, copy intelligently. 
You must be able to say as a Bible teacher, what is the logos of the teaching? What is the logos? That's why preachers have what we call the topic of the message. Because actually, the topic of the message is the logos. For example, what is the topic of this series? In Christ, Paul's revelation of identification. Season what? Three. So that means season one is in Christ. Expanded vocabulary. Expanded verbiage of in Christ. Season two is in Christ. An expansion of the same. Season three is in Christ. An expansion of the same. Then season four coming. There's even season five. So, Logos, the heart of the matter, the thought, the idea, the reason behind what is written, the mindset behind what is written. So, you should be able to say what is the Logos of any teaching. You don't have to write everything. Write like Luke wrote. He wrote them in the order of sequence. So they had to use a version of explaining truth. That you will, you will not undersay it in any form. But you will pass your message across very well. I tell those of us, you know, who are in book study. We do book study in pastoral institute. You must be able to understand the formality in writing. You must. As a disciple maker, as a Bible teacher, you must be able to understand the formality in writing. It's different from speaking. While speaking can take you six good hours. You want to be able to put the whole thing that is spoken in five verses. And yet losing no substance. Yet losing no substance. So you will have to know how to shorten some things in such a way you are not understating it. But in such a way that anybody reading it will assimilate even the things that are not said. That is, you use words that insinuate things that are not said. But the reader, the reader will know that something is insinuated here and here that has not been. And when the reader now wants to explain, he brings what is said along with the things insinuated. I don't know if I'm complicated at all. That is the Logos. That is the Logos. Now, thank you, Lord. Are you still here? So when he said Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, you know that there's no verse like that. But all the verses are saying that Logos, the message. Verse 3 and 4, died according to the scriptures. Buried, rose again the third day according to the scripture is the message of the Old Testament. So in John chapter 7 verse 37, let's look at something else. John chapter 7 verse number 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Next verse. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, <laughs> as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. There's no scripture like that. See what Paul did in Corinthians. Jesus is doing it in John. Because it's the same pattern, same style, same mode of communication. See Jesus, as the scripture has said. So that means when you put all the scripture together, the summary of all the scripture is that out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, stay with me. Are you in the building? Stay with me. Now, Jesus is putting the entire body of the scriptures, Old Testament, into one singular message. Then look at verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So that means what Jesus was saying is, what the scripture is talking about 
is that in my glorification, I will give my spirit. And what is the gift of the spirit? The forgiveness of sins. What is the gift of the spirit? Justification by faith. As the scripture has said, the Logos, as the scripture has said. So you should be able to use in a few words what was said in many words. So imagine when he said, as the scripture has said, I want to believe that Jesus, as his pattern was, quoted a lot of Old Testament texts and said, this is all of these texts I have quoted. This is what the scripture is saying. Jesus must have quoted. But when they were documenting, they gave us the logos of his message. The logos of his message. Just like the Sermon on the Mount. He must have quoted many verses. Matthew now said, love your enemies. He got it from the written word by bringing together many things. Love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. See that? So Jesus had a short form of saying those things just like they wrote and spoke. Look at the sermon on the day of Pentecost. Today, if you are to repeat, it won't take more than five minutes. If you are to repeat what the book of Acts recorded that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, it won't take more than five minutes. I'm sure he spoke longer than that. But when you take out what he said, this is the logos of it all. This is the message. In everything he said, this is the message among several scriptures. Also notice that in the days of Jesus, he said some things in what you can call an Ihoris term. Ihoris term. Now, an Ihoris term is a theological grammar. Okay? Don't let it bother you. It means to say something now as though it has happened. Even though what you are saying will happen in a later date. That's an Ihori statement. For example, he said, I am come that you may have life and be abundant. But when he said it, nobody had received life. That's an Ihori statement. Do you understand? To say something now, as if it is happening now, but it is for a future date. An Ihori statement. Interestingly, Paul used a kind of language. Let's examine Paul's language. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I will not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. The way Paul writes. That guy. Now, before I get into dismantling this, remember that pneumaticos will be things of the spirit. Huh? And we have identified the spirit. Huh? Is Paul's spirit Jesus' spirit? Is Paul's, he will guide you, in, is Jesus' he will guide you into all the truth? Paul's, he will guide you into all the truth? Is Jesus' He will show you things. Paul's things of the spirit. Huh? Okay. So now, the spirit of truth. Numa Alatia. That Jesus spoke about will live in. That spirit will live in. And when it lives in, it will change the identity of the person it is living in. The spirit will live in. And when he lives in, it will change the identity of the man. And then that defines the communication that is given to the person. And brother Paul uses it the same way. What he will say is spiritual. Who receives it is also spiritual. Is that right? Spirituals are received by a man that is what? Spiritual. Okay? Now, and that is why Brother Paul will now say, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye that are spiritual. Galatians 6.1. 1 
1 Corinthians 14, 37. Those who flow in the things of the spirit, gifts of the spirit, they are also called spiritual. So it's used for persons. Then subtext. The subtext is referring to the actions of the person. And it's also used for the information that is delivered to us by the gospel. Used for persons, used for the actions of the persons. Then it is also used for the information that is delivered to us by the gospel. Person, actions, information. Spiritual. Look at 1 Corinthians now. 10 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I will not that you should be ignorant that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now look at verse 2. And we are all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Kai, Paul. Baptized unto Moses. Now I need you to understand the way he is writing. Baptized unto Moses in the sea and in the cloud is a figure of speech because Moses is not a pool of water. So when you say they were baptized unto Moses, it's figurative. Then look at verse 3. Pay attention. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? Use of language. Look at the next one. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Way to. But if they ate, why did they die? Because you can't eat spiritual meat and die. So it's a way with words. That's the Sophia. That's the Sophia Peter was talking about that. Brother Paul, you have to be careful because if not, you can twist what he is saying. Because now what he is saying is not really clear. If they drank Christ, they shouldn't have died. If they ate Christ, they shouldn't have died. But Paul said they ate. Paul said they drank. Now remember, these guys, just like John they were writing after the event. They didn't write before. So it's after event writing. So in their interpretation, don't look at it literal. When you read, don't look literal. Watch this. He said they did it. Is the word efango in the Greek. They did it. Yet they did not eat. They did drink. Yet they did not drink because he wouldn't have said verse 5 if they really ate and drank. Give me verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. So if they ate spiritual meat and drank Christ, why wouldn't God be pleased? You don't see why you must be careful with the polite theology. <laughs> so he's using an uh, Ihorist term here. This is Ihorist. And he wrote after the event. Which means they were given to eat, but didn't eat. They were given to drink, but didn't drink. So with many of them, now look at me everybody. <laughs> they ate, but didn't eat. They drank, but didn't drink. Wake up, should we speak in tongues? <laughs> they drank, but didn't drink. They ate, but didn't eat. The rock brought water. They were to see beyond the water, to drink the water. But they drank the water and left the water. 
Am I communicating at all? Is brother Paul Sophia. They saw meat. But they were to see meat. But didn't see meat. So they ate meat. But didn't eat meat. So with them, God was not pleased. Because they missed the idea. It's like they are pouring you anointing oil. But you are not anointed. You are eating bread and rabina. But you are not eating bread and rabina. I don't know if I am communicating at all. It's brother Paul's Sophia. They ate. But didn't eat. That's why they were overthrown in the wilderness. Are we together? Okay, sit down, let's move. So it's a play of words. Because God was not pleased with them. Because obviously, they ate and they drank. So what Paul is talking about here is spiritual. They were given to eat and given to drink. And with them, God was not pleased. That's quite a way of writing. So many times, when we read the words of Jesus, Jesus who said things like, that have not happened, but he will say them as if they have happened, but they have not happened, but he only said them as if they have happened because they were possible. They had not happened, but he said, Lazarus, our friend, is sleeping. Let's go and wake him up. Why do we have to go and wake him up? If he sleeps, it's because he needs it. Let him rest. When he finishes resting, he will wake up. Jesus said he's dead. The same way Jesus played with words, Paul played with words. I'm teaching. Same way. So that's why like I said, we all have Bibles to read. But you need the Bible to be explained. That's why you come to church. That's why I'm here for you. To explain and bring you to understanding what is written. Understandest thou? How can I accept some? So he that descended gave gifts to men. For the perfected. So perfection takes place in the explanation of scripture. And when a man has received adequate explanation of scripture, he is fit to do ministry. So ministry is not a product of vision. It's a product of spiritual growth in the knowledge of the scriptures. Am I communicating at all? That's why every man a minister. Every man a minister. But you know, when I was growing up in my Christian journey, I wasn't taught that. I was taught that there are people that are specially called a class of people. Everybody is not called. That's one of the lies. One of the false things that was taught the church. Meanwhile, every child of God is called. All of us are priests. There are no people that have special access to God. God is not a grandfather. God is a father. Now, that's a way of writing. So many times when we read the words of Jesus, he will say things that have not happened. For example, John 4.10. Living water. John chapter 4 verse 10. He says, living water. John chapter 4 verse 14. It will be in him a well springing up to everlasting life. That didn't happen again. But there were explanations of Old Testament terms. Use of water in the Old Testament 
is used by Jesus to refer to man and spiritually speaking. John chapter 3 verse 3 to 5. Look at the way Jesus will speak about water. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Next verse. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Next verse. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God except a man is born again. He cannot see the kingdom except a man is born of water which is symbolic or referring to the spirit. He cannot, please pay attention, don't miss this. He cannot enter into the kingdom. So to enter the kingdom, you have to be born of the spirit. So the day you were born of the spirit, you entered the kingdom. Which kingdom? Kingdom of heaven. Heaven at last is one of those lies that is preached in churches. Heaven at last. So they use that to tie believers. You don't understand. See, you don't understand. When I preach to you a doctrine of heaven at last, what it does is I put you under pressure and under control and I have the remote in my hand because I have pointed you to a destination that you have not yet arrived. That means for you to arrive there will be qualifications. So I use those qualifications to keep controlling you even though there is nothing like that. So you are, you are hoping for what does not exist and you are being manipulated for somebody's personal gain. Because ultimately, the beneficiary of your actions in your bid to make heaven at last is the pastor that is manipulating you. Because now I can tell you, since you are not yet there, you will have to get there. There's a place called there. Heaven at last. We will not know whether you will enter or not till that day. In order for you to qualify. One, two, three, four, five. And any time you are not able to measure up, I put a reminder. So I keep flogging you and you keep trying you try, you're almost dying, but of what use will be your death if you cannot make it? So even at the point of death, you are still trying to make it. Meanwhile, the preacher who told you those things is not doing those things because he himself knows he has already arrived. Wicked men on the pulpit. Paul calls them witches. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched, is a bewitchment. They use it to collect your money. They use it to make you do their kind of evangelism. You didn't hear. Because their kind of evangelism is not about the salvation of souls. It's about the gathering of numbers to build a mega church. And the people will gather, whether they are sure of heaven or not, whether they know what it means to be born again or not, just gather them because it's a game of numbers. The more members, the more money. If you have 10,000 members and everyone gives one 1,000, it's 1,000 times 10,000. Imagine what that would be in every service. So it's a game of numbers because ultimately the beneficiary is the preacher. 
So he has to keep that battle. He has to fight and make you keep looking for heaven at last. We come to you in the honesty of our hearts. Not looking for anything to benefit from you. And we tell you it's not heaven at last. It's heaven at first. So that you can be in rest as you walk with God. Then they call us heretics. Can you see blackmail? But we are too old for that blackmail. The day you got born again was the day you made heaven. And you cannot be lost. Once you enter, you have entered. Our citizenship is where? Kibadona. You know, there was a year I was making mockery of a billboard that was in front of our church. And people think it was personal. I have nothing personal. When I attack things, it's not because there's anything personal. What am I looking for? Am I going to go and empty the man's members to my church? Some of the members don't even know I exist. So it's not about membership. If it's to gather members I was after, I won't teach what I'm teaching. And I will gather the members. And we will pull down this building five times. And God has said, me, look, you people don't know something. Abel Damir, if I do something, I do it to the maid in Japan. To the end of the journey. So if I was about gathering members, what they are doing, I will have done it at a superior level. And I will gather the members, make all the money, kill my conscience, and not damn the consequences. But that's not the idea. I have a master who died for me. And to him I will answer. I have a master who died for me. I'm not in a game of numbers. Whose church is bigger? Whose church is small? I'm not in those things. It's for children. It's infantile. We've gone beyond that. It's for... Yes. We're talking about men's eternity, one person at a time. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. So the man did a billboard. 40 days fasting. Seven days of open door. I mean of open heaven. Can you see the wickedness in that? You people don't understand. I will close this service now. <laughs> 40 days fasting. Seven days. That is wicked. What is that? That is you can only enjoy open heaven for seven days after fasting. And after the 40 days, if you want another seven days. And after the fast, if you want another seven days. What is that? Bondage. Meanwhile, since Jesus died and rose, the heavens have never been closed. You don't even need fasting for an open heaven. You don't need a heaven open. That's where you live. I'm teaching good here. That's where you live. That's your residence. The day you got born again, you entered the kingdom. Which kingdom? Kingdom of heaven. Now, you won't understand kingdom if you didn't follow the series. <laughs> Because I have been building to get to this point. Uh, let me round up and close. In Matthew chapter 5, when he spoke about, you know, about, about, about it, he makes the sun to shine on the good and on the bad. Did you observe? Then he said he makes the rain to fall on the good and on the bad. 
He doesn't make use of fire or storm. He didn't say he makes the storm to fall. He didn't say he makes the fire to fall. He used only rain and sunlight. That is instructive of God's character. Huh? But anywhere you see fire is figurative and is usually used on the devil and his cohorts. He uses the rain and the sun as blessedness. He calms the storm, no doubt. That in itself is a way of explaining the Old Testament. So all along, they were following as disciples. Then he told them one day, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And the new birth happened. So how he now explains to them further is by taking them through all the scriptures. Then Luke wrote, then opened it their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So the very same way that when the deaf ear is unstopped, the ear continues to hear. Jesus sets a pattern for us. And from that point, he is able to fulfill John 14, 26. Put it up. John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Please observe, because I'm going to close on this note, and, but I wanted to get this, because I'll start from here in the next service. I will look at some heavenly realities in the next service. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. I have said unto you. Look at that John 16, 7. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Next verse. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Next verse. Of sin because they believe not on me. Next verse. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Next verse. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he is come? When he is come, he will guide you into all of the truth. That is, the things you will hear from my spirit will be in total clarity. That means their eyes and their minds were opened and it remained opened. So therefore, their use of heaven will be Jesus' use of heaven, which is Moses' use of heaven. Consistency of theology. Because Jesus used heaven the way Moses used it in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Don't forget this. Heaven and earth is used for invisible and visible. The Oranios in the Greek. So therefore, heaven and earth now becomes a Bible language. Heaven on earth now becomes a Bible language for explaining the invisible here on earth. Yeah. Heaven and earth therefore becomes a shorthand of talking about man in two dimensions. A shorthand of talking about man in two walls. Heaven and earth, therefore, 
becomes a phrase descriptive of operations on the earth. It becomes a phrase descriptive of operations on the earth. The same way the heavens are when we fly jets, fly aeroplanes, and birds fly. It's still within the earth sphere. That's why you can see the birds, you can see the planes. Yet it is called the earth by description and explanation. So the same way heaven and earth refers to where man is. Man is in heaven on earth. Oh, oh, oh. Heaven came down. My sins were washed. And my night. Heaven came down. And glory feel the day you got born again, heaven came in, Christ in you, heaven in you. Oh, 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 oh. heaven is in my see that all of those songs we are songs that were written with the reality of this understanding. Oh, 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 heaven is in my heart. Because God has planted eternity in our hearts. Say with me very loud, I'm born again. The day I got born again, I became a citizen of heaven. Right now, I am in heaven on earth. Amen. Get on your feet, that's all I've got for you in yourselves. Glory to God. Blessed. If you are blessed this morning, shout blessed. Yes. Turn to your neighbor say, you are not going to make heaven. You made heaven the day you were born of the spirit. The day you were born again. You made heaven. Right now, you are in heaven on earth. Glory! Glory. Tell your neighbor, you are God's heaven. He lives in you. Amen. Heaven is immortality in mortality. Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. Days of heaven on the earth. Men walking the face of the earth with invisible authority. Making things happen on earth that earth cannot explain. Yeah. The immortal ruling over the mortal. The invisible controlling the visible. So when things are not obeying me in the physical, I switch into mentongondongze. Lengrondo lebra. Agabato beleteta. Lembro jacato. Lebra tandele de bobosa. And then suddenly things begin to change. Things are shifting. Things are changing. When you begin to operate your heaven status, things shift. Things change. Things are just. Somebody shout miracles. Yeah. That's what you are. You are a miracle. You are a miracle. Praise God. Bless this morning. Lift your right hands, Father. Thank you that revelation knowledge keeps growing big in our hearts and in this house and all over the nations of the earth. Revelation upon revelation of your word. And thank you that you are building an army that the devil is already afraid of eternally. I give you praise that everyone hearing the sound of my voice is being equipped for these last days to manifest the glory of God like never before. And we give you praise. Sickness does not operate in this ministry. So whatever looks like sickness is terminated. Everyone is robust in health. Everyone is strong and healthy. Everyone is fat and flourishing. To show that the Lord is upright. And there is no unrighteousness in him. I decree that your body is equipped to carry the mandate. In the name of Jesus. You fulfill the purpose of God. You live out the will of God. You live out the plan of God. You are far from error and mistakes. Grace is upon your life. 
in Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Well, go ahead and celebrate for 10 seconds. Is that how they celebrate? Is that how you celebrate in heaven? Glory! Amen! Woo! Blessed! I want to take up your honor offerings. We give every time intentionally and deliberately in this house. The online community, you two all also give. We give in the campuses and everyone that follows this ministry every time we hear the word because we have, we have a culture of honor in this church. It's in our culture to honor the word of God that we receive. And part of our honoring God's word is that we give in honor of the word. So wherever you're watching around the world, I want you to package your offerings. There are banking details scrolling on the screens, both on television and on social media. And the radio audience, of course, Mr. Michael Bush, read the accounts for you to give in the offerings so that together we keep getting this word to the ends of the earth. Now, while that is going on, remember, we are raising, um, you know, we are raising mission funds that should be redeemed by the end of January. You know, and I want to thank those of you that have already started redeeming yours into the various accounts we sent to you. And in case you're watching and you, are, you ask for an account and we have not yet still responded, maybe your mail went to our spam box or something, I would please kindly request that you resend the mail so we can treat it and make sure you get your details. And I want to thank those of you that are already redeeming your commitments. And in case this is your first time of hearing about the funds, we're raising 100,000 US dollars for the first phase of our work as the new year begins. And you know that right now we're not doing anything because we're still praying and preparing the atmosphere for work. But while we're doing that, we're also asking the people of God to give willingly. Remember, somebody gave. That's why you heard the gospel from this ministry. If you also give and others who are hearing give, more people will hear this gospel. This year we are deliberate about our invading the world with the truth of Christ. We are not apologetic at all. But you know that anytime there is warfare, money is part of warfare because we need money to get into the available platforms and push the gospel aggressively. So in case you're watching and you want to say, look, Dr. Damien, I want to be part of this $100,000 giving. I need the details. All you need to do today is send a mail to me, Dr. Abel Damina, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Once I get your mail, I will send you a letter with the right accounts that are designated for these givings. But I want to thank you in advance. Praise God. Now lift up your offerings. Father, we give in faith. We give with joy. Our offerings are a sweet smell before you today. And thank you for the privilege of making a difference through our givings. And we thank you for the blessing upon this house. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Now remember, like I said, we're in our 40 days fast and it continues tomorrow. Of course, I'll be teaching in the next service. And then this evening, this evening, we continue with our usual routine. 6 to 7, 7 to 8, 9 to 10, 10 to 11, tomorrow morning, 5 to 6. Then you break the fast. You eat through the day and do your normal day activities. But 6 in the evening, you are back in this house. The online, you are back online. The campuses, you meet according to the instructions of the campus coordinator. And then we continue again till next Friday. Saturdays, we are in houses. Sunday, we are back here. Next Sunday will be over half of the days for this fast. And then I'll give you more instructions on what God will have us do. But if you're a part of this ministry, this is not a time to stay away. Because it could be very disastrous in, in concerning you following the things that God will have you do. It's important you stay in this season of consecration. Once again, we love you. We're signing you off. And I look forward to connecting with all of you at the 11 o'clock service. Because we're going to open up more.